Okay. Um, I, I sort of was asked what, what I'd like to talk about today, and, and I, I came out with a sentence which I realized didn't quite make much sense at the time, and I wondered why I said that. But the title of this talk is The Path of the Serpent and How to Find Freedom in Tomorrow's World. And, and that can spin you off into an old BBC series, and you, you're wondering, <laughs> is he talking about AI? <laughs> no, but not. But we do need to address two questions. What is the path of the serpent? And what is true freedom? And more importantly, why is that so important for us today? So I'm going to try and, and, uh, and answer those questions. Um, but to start with, I, I think we need to list, look at back at some lessons from the past. And perhaps surprisingly, I'm going to take you back to the French Revolution in 1789. We've got any, I would like to check. Have we got any historians who are particularly good at the French Revolution here in the audience? <laughs> okay. Fine. I, I, I'm going to try and be as accurate as I can be with this. But um, one of the first things that struck me as strange, which I don't think you may not have realized, that the French Revolution took 10 years. I mean, it, it started in, in, in uh, the, the, around about the storming of the Bastille. Uh, where the, uh, the poor people were, were rescuing their friends who'd been wrongly jailed. And I should perhaps explain why I'm starting here. Louis XVI had completely decimated the country financially with his really bad spending. Um, There's uh, huge issues with poverty. They'd had <laughs> bad harvests, so there was no food. And... At that point, there was a 65% inflation rate, 22% wages. So even if their wages were going up, the inflation was much, much more. Uh, people were being imprisoned wrongly. Uh, there was robbery, and there were people being killed. It was a tough time. And the, the peasants, they were called peasants, but they were just poor people, they rose up and really wanted to end the uh, royalty and start their republic. But it took 10 years for them to do this, and it was very difficult, uh, and it led to all sorts of uh, horrific uh, things. It was called, labeled the Reign of Terror. Uh, but uh, I, I'll, I can't help but thinking how similar some of this is today, with in increasing inflation, much higher than the wages, uh, dissatisfaction with the leaders, uh, and uh, people being wrongly imprisoned. I think of uh, Assange and others. Uh, we're in a very similar boat, but, but fortunately we're British. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at the France at the moment, you might be forgiven for, for, for realizing what actually is happening over there with all the yellow jackets and the riots and all that's going on over there. And even uh, back then in, in the Louis XVI days, they had French colonies. Uh, and again, the, the, there is rebelling in the French colonies, colleges today in the Niger, in West Africa. There's a lot of similarities to what was happening then and what was happening uh, today. So why are, we, why are we going down this route in particular? Well, the actual... Uh, a large proportion of uh, wealthy middle-class French people decided that the best option for them was to leave the country. And they migrated, and a lot of them went to Germany. And uh, part of the talk starts about what they did there, what they found there, and, and uh, something they came across. But, uh, so what we have to look at today is uh, the sort of policy, what it was like back then and what it's like today, and the sort of suppression that they were, uh, they were subjected to and the suppression that we're subjected to today. And I've split it up into sort of physical, mental, and emotional suppression. And the physical suppression is typically, uh, we have, we're moving into 15-minute cities, poverty, uh, and... In the mental side of things, we have poor education, lies all the time, mass hypnosis with the uh, rep repetition in, in the media, 
and constantly trying to keep us negative and in emotions, trying to make us afraid, doubt and anger. All of those things were why these German, uh, French migrants moved over to Germany as well. So with all these wealthy Germans arriving, in, well, French arriving in Germany, there was a, a Frenchman called Johann von Schiller, who was a writer, and he thought, well, I'm, I'm going to start a new publication. He called it Die Horen, The Hours. And he thought, I'm going to market to this new influx of wealthy migrants that have come to this country. And he thought about what would these people like to know when they come to Germany. So he thought about things like, well, the rules, the taxation, everything you'd need to know as a migrant, he put in this magazine. But he had a friend called Johann Wolfram, Wolfram von Goethe. And you might have heard of Goethe from uh, his, his work in the past. And he asked Goethe to, uh, to write six articles for him, for this new journal he was putting together, on the subject of freedom. So Goethe said, OK, uh, you're a friend of mine, thanks. I'm not going to come around and see you again. <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll write the articles for you. And after the fifth article, uh, he realized that the migrants had money. They'd found work. They had family with them. But they still felt restricted. So just imagine yourself if you've gone to live in another country. You have some money. If you've migrated away from this country, you've got your friends with you, you've got work, you've got incoming in. Why, why are you not free? Why do you still not feel free? What's holding you back? What's holding us back now? And in, in uh, the case of the French, they felt restricted because they couldn't return home. It was all different for them. They, they were missing their homeland. So there's something about this that, that he wasn't really addressing in, in his articles. And, and Goethe thought about it for long and hard. He began to realize that it, it's similar to a project that he'd been working on all his life. And he'd been wondering how he was going to put this across. And it was a subject of freedom, but a different type of freedom. What he'd realized was that freedom couldn't be obtained. You couldn't get given it externally. It could only come from within, internally. So he wanted to write something which would express that to the migrants, to say, well, if you really want to feel free, this is where you've got to look. You've got to look within. And he did it in a rather strange way. He actually started to put all the thoughts he'd had together into a fairy story. Has anyone heard of Goethe's fairy story? Any hands? One or two? Excellent. Well, if you don't put your hands up, I'd be worried. <laughs> it's not something that's publicized very much. It's called Die Marchen, uh, in, in Die Marchen just the fairy tale in, in Germany. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that today because. Uh, it is absolutely incredible what he put together it, as a story. So, he, he, this is what he wrote in the sixth article. It's a short story, but I'm going to give you a rough outline of it uh, today. It starts off with several characters. E by the way, every single thing in this story is symbolized. It has a meaning for something. And being something which is a, a story, it's creative. And he's tapping into his levels of high levels of inspiration. And when you do that, your subconscious feeds you with ideas and more symbolism. And in the end, he puts together this thing, which he doesn't fully understand himself. Some of the some of the main characters, he didn't understand the symbols. And even at the very end of having finished this, he offered a prize to anybody <laughs> who could who could interpret it for him. Fully. And to, to give you an example of how uh, hard that was, um, and how challenging it was, I'm going to introduce you to, uh, well, introduce you, you know about Rudolf Steiner, I'm, guess, I'm guessing. But Rudolf Steiner, if, 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 an amazing philosopher, started anthroposophy, the study of the science of the spirit, uh, at the Waldorf schools and Steiner schools, and, and uh, 
or biodynamic farming. But if you've ever read his autobiography, um, he early on started to look for somebody he could he could relate to in regards to philosophy, with, just to try and fit in his own observations of the world around him. And he was seeing things which nobody could describe with science. But he picked one philosopher, and that was Goethe. And Goethe was able to uh, reach to, towards what Steiner was seeing more better than any other philosopher, which is why he, I mean, he studied Goethe for many years, went on to, to create this huge architectural uh, building called the Goetheanum, which was his homage to, 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 to Goethe. But Steiner had come across the fairy tale, Dismarchant, and had studied it. And he'd spent nearly 20, 30 years of his life also trying to understand what this actually meant. One of the, one of the problems, even, even Jung had the same problem with this Carl Jung, is that the indoctrination by the church with regards to serpents meant that they all thought that serpents were in some way associated with evil. And that really challenged them when it came, came to this uh, main character in this story, which is the green serpent. So I'm going to give you a rough outline of the story now so you'll, you'll see where I'm coming from and uh, how this is related to, to what we're talking about. There's two sides of a river and on the one side it's called the land of the senses and the other side is the land of spirit <coughs> and throughout the tale the characters seem to have a problem going from one side to the other side but it starts off with uh, a ferryman on the one side and he's the person that takes people across the river to the land of spirit and he gets a knock on his door in the middle of the night and these two gentlemen are looking to cross the river. They're actually he calls them gentlemen of the night or will of the wisps and here we're introduced to elementals and Goethe was very familiar with the elementals he wrote about them and uh, he also had, had interactions with him himself in an Italian garden down in, in Sicily. So the will o' wisps are taken across the boat but uh, they wanted to pay the ferryman with gold coins and the ferryman said don't pay me gold if, if gold escapes into this river the huge waters will engulf us and carry us away and the uh, will-o'-wisps basically said well that's all we can pay for and uh, we'd have nothing else to pay now they, they were dumped on the other side of the bank and the, the ferryman said, you, you have to pay with something else with, which I can eat, artichokes, onions, that sort of thing. Um, eventually, the, the will-o'-wisp said, okay, we're gonna, we'll, well, I'll find you someone who can pay you in those things. And, and he was allowed, he allowed them to go. So we're automatically thinking, well, we've got two sides of the, the, the river here, the physical world, the land of the senses, which is where we live now, and the land of the spirit which is where we presumably go after we passed over. And you can think of the ferryman as a bit like Charon crossing the river Styx and taking the souls of the to, 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 the, to the, the world of spirit. This is all very well for the moment, but it's a nice and easy way of, of, of explaining that we, we'll, we can interpret it easily that way. But then we hear more about the gold because the ferryman couldn't take the gold back on the boat. So he hid the, the gold in a small crevice on the rocks and they, they trickled down into the rocks well away from the uh, in, into the little chasm well away from the water at the bottom of this chasm there was a green snake and she heard the noise and saw these gold coins and promptly ate them and in doing this she became luminous and she remembered that back in the past that this was possible and then we get to a really interesting part because she then comes up to the surface wondering where the gold coins came from. And she finds these lights over not far away. And these lights are now the will-o'-wisps because will-o'-wisps are shape changers. They change. And the conversation that she has with them and they have with her is very illuminating because automatically we're thinking of serpents, snakes. What does a serpent mean? And uh, she comes up to the lights 
and they say, hello, lady cousin, you of the horizontal line, whereas we are of the vertical line. Now, I've checked the German translation of this with people who could do that. And, uh, the, the, the big question is, what is this about? What is the horizontal line and the vertical line about? As a geobiologist, yeah, it, it begins to look fairly obvious. This is a conversation between the serpent energies, the earth energy lines, which are horizontal, run across our land, and the kundalini forces, and the vertical energies. The energies are similar, but not the same. The vertical and horizontal. So now we're talking about the energies within us and the energies around us. And this now has a net irrelevance to this story and where it's going. We're now at the point where the will-o'-wisps are saying, how do I get to see Lily, the beautiful Lily, the princess Lily? And the green said, well, I'm sorry, you've made a wasted trip because she's actually on the other side of the river. Anyone got an idea what this river is representing perhaps yet? Sorry? Flow of life. Flow of life? Mm, no, it's between the worlds. Yeah. Choice. Choice. Actually, it's what we find between the worlds. That's the entrance, yes. But we're talking about what Steiner calls the abyss, the darkness. Others call the false astral. And there we begin to get an indication of, well, why would gold react so badly in this illusory world of make-believe? What is gold itself in, in, it's in being symbolized in this in this whole thing. I, I won't be able to run through all the symbols today but uh, and what they, what they mean. But you begin to see that the gold has various different elements of, of purity in, the, in this story. And there's gold coming from a, a divine lamp held by an old man which makes everything gold that it shines on. Pure gold. Then there's the gold from the elementals, the, the gentleman, the two twin of the wisps, the twin, the, 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 the twin flames, they're all the same, they're the elementals. Their gold isn't quite the same quality. If gold, which is degrees of truth, fall into something which is false, everything collapses. You can begin to see some mirroring here now with the truth and the illusion and the falsity and the lies all around us and where that's coming from. The, the purity of the gold and the truth is now relevant to the journey across from the land of the senses to the land of the spirit. So the, the two will o are saying, well, how do we get back across the river? The ferryman's already gone. And she says, yes, the ferryman only takes us one way. So you can only die and take the boat across. But there are other ways. For instance, you can go back to that world with the help of the giant. Or you can go back with me on the green. And I, I go at midnight and midday, and the giant goes at dusk and dawn. So you begin to see that the giant is actually related to sleeping and lucid moments before you fall asleep or before you wake up lucid moments when you can connect with the world of spirit that's the connection that that giant is referring to but the green serpent now seems to be the way across between the worlds and here we're beginning to get an understanding of what the path of the serpent is meaning in, in this case but I, if you're looking at uh, the way all these worlds are represented in different cultures uh, in, in the Jewish and the Hebrew culture, they have something called the, the Sephiroth, which is all these different worlds or spheres, like the sphere of Tippereth in the middle. And there's paths between them all. Uh, and, and the ancient Hebrews actually call these things the path of the swords and the path of the serpents. These are the paths between the worlds. So the path of the serpent is one of the ways we move between this world and the spiritual world. 
So what's this tale all about and how is it coming? Anything to do with, uh, with freedom? Uh, well, I'll get to that in a moment. But uh, midday comes along and will with wisps with, with, with the green snake go across, back across the river to meet the beautiful lily. The beautiful lily uh, also is waiting to hear for something, uh, news. She's waiting for something to happen. And uh, and she speaks to, to the green snake. And, and also at that time, they've collected another character, the prince, and the old lady, and the old man with the van line all comes along. And this is where you find the beautiful lily uh, has a conversation with the green snake. And the green snake forms a perfect circle. He puts his tail in his mouth. And there is a sign of the Ouroboros. And we learn earlier that as she's going towards the lily, she's joined by her companions and they have a hissing conversation together. So there's other invisible snakes coming towards lily. And what we find here, without going too, too, too long into this, is that the beautiful lily is a node, an earth energy line node. All the serpents, all the lions come into this node. And when it forms a circle like that, that's when the node is able to be worked. And that's when the whole party then go on a journey through the serpent across to the other side. So this is a story which is about how do you go from one side of the land of the senses to the land of the spirit and using energy lines and vortexes uh, and the truth. Uh, but how does that help our understanding when it comes to true freedom? What's that got to do with this? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the gap between the worlds, the abyss is the river, the false astral. Uh, we're in the realms here of meditation, incubatory journeys. And this is where we can begin to learn a bit more from uh, Steiner and Carl Jung. And Styler talks about taking a journey, a meditative journey. Uh, he warns us about three beasts that we face when we cross the abyss. And these beasts will mock our understanding of our knowledge if it's not the true nature of reality. It will create fear in us and it will create doubt within us. You also find that Jung, Carl Jung, in his uh, Red Book Journeys, you've looked at the pictures he has, he drew, he came across the same spirit of the depths, the spirit of our times, and the devil. Again, each of them mocking his, his, his views on reality, and they relentlessly mocked him for thinking that serpents were evil. They mocked him for thinking duality was about polar opposites. It's got nothing to do with opposites. Um, and they tried to make him fearful and doubt what he was doing all the time. Both of them, though, had an interesting, similar experience at the outset with the guardian, the guardian of the threshold. Both of them considered the guardian as being a huge giant who was there to prevent the unprepared traveler from making the crossing. We're getting some similarities from two geniuses here, as well as Goethe tells it, telling us about the, the two will-o'-the-wisps who later became the flames, who were invisible in the day, but who could be seen at night. There's an elemental aspect to crossing the abyss and, and having to go through the nodes. Even when the, the party that crossed back are taken to the rock sanctuary, which is the final part of the, the, the fairy tale, they have to wait for the twin flames to open the door to the portal in order to get into the sanctuary. So there's a lot of elements in this which are beginning to show us how group meditation differs from individual meditation and how we should be coming together in groups. But before we get to that, Jung and Steiner are saying both, we have to prepare physically, mentally and emotionally before we even make this journey.
Fairly obviously, it's having no doubts, no fear, and seeking only the truth. And Steiner says in his first class lessons at the end of, at the end of his life, we have to learn how to soar over the abyss. So it's this soaring over the abyss that becomes the question, how do we do that? What, what has that got to do with where we are? So it's the soaring over the abyss that's now called the path of the serpent. It's the journey of the soul. When you can soar like a bird, that is freedom of the soul. And once you've done that, it can't be taken away. You will be free wherever you are, and nothing can take that from you. No politician, no jail, nothing. So you can see how Goethe's message, in amongst all his symbolism, was that if you meditate and you can soar, if your soul can soar like a bird across to the world of spirit, you will have no doubts, you'll have no fear. You'll just be expecting the truth to be given and now. It, it reminded me of Leonard Skinner's Free Bird. Yeah. Yeah. You'll, you'll remember the first part, which is, uh, I am free as a bird now. But the second part is equally relevant. Having learned to soar, it says, this bird cannot be changed. So once you've learned how to soar, your soul is endlessly liberated. You'll never be... And this is the message you wanted to get to the migrants. You said, you've actually, you've done everything else. You've got your houses, you've got your income, you've got your friends around you. But if you still feel restricted, you've got to go within and find that freedom from within. And the only way you're going to do that is if you conquer your emotions and you meditate and you find that spiritual freedom. I think that, that's an interesting message for us to, to take forward today. I just want to add an aspect of why actually we think we're being restricted. This whole world right now is undergoing some major energetic changes. It's liberating in one ways, but it's challenging in others. And what we're finding is that people are reacting differently. You've got on the one side the, the people who are trying to put us down make us despair, have anger and fear through all the restrictions they're placing, the shutdowns, 15 minutes it is, all those kind of things. They want to suppress us. They want to make us despair. But why? Is it for their own reason? Is it just for them to have global control, owning everything? Or is it perhaps something to help us recognize this is a challenge we have to overcome? And there's an aspect here which is one of the most important parts of meditation, <coughs> as I've been led to, led to believe. And that is our will. The intensity of will at the outset, when we start meditation. If you have that intensity, you can take the lift off. You can get to the other side. Without that intensity, you stop halfway. So if we can just be doubted, if we can just have enough despair to not have the intensity, the drive, the spirit to actually go forth and stand up against the, the, the people who are trying to put us down, we won't get to the other side either. That will is supremely important. And one of the reasons why this is so important is when we meditate we have to surrender everything after we've prepared and that very thing that we need to start that strength of will we have to surrender and let that momentum carry us across and this is the sort of thing we're getting from from Goethe's fairy tale and Jung and Steiner and we're learning about how we begin to do meditation and specifically meditation in groups it's why the people who would wish to control us are trying to destroy our spirit 
And this is why the suppression of freedom is so important to them, as it stops us soaring like a bird. But they can't stop us once we've learned to store. So the soul is our I, our identity, who we really are. And spiritual beings, we're spiritual beings experiencing a physical existence right now. Our soul is a reminder of who we really are. And it gives us strength and power, and more importantly, individual sovereignty. So if we're looking back at this question, the path of the serpent leading to this sense of freedom, the true freedom. We can take one more step forward and say, well, how does this now relate to today? And one of the things we can learn from all three, Jung's work and Steiner's work and Goethe's work, is that we're all individuals. And it's really important that we recognize our individual uniqueness. It's a challenge and an opportunity. The challenge is because with everyone thinking and feeling and being different, it's difficult to get on with anybody. Everyone thinks differently. Steiner talked about the move from the fifth epoch to the sixth epoch, which I think what we're going through right now, is you'll recognize some characteristic traits in the sixth epoch in people. Firstly, you'll recognize telepathy, empathy. You'll hear things that you are basically from somebody else's thinking. You're hearing that. You'll feel other people's feelings. You may feel their pain or you'll feel their hunger. Another characteristic trait he said that you'll find is that the fruits of belief will lay solely on the individual. Well, that means is that we'll all have our own beliefs. There'll be no collective beliefs, no control of collective belief systems like religions over anybody anymore, any, any dogma. We're all going to become so completely individual. And you can see that has a challenge as well as an opportunity. The challenge is we're all going to be totally divided. Have a look around. I mean, how many times can you split male and female into all these different sections? Everyone's got their own beliefs, rightly or wrongly. But where is this a positive? And what we discovered in, in, in Earth energy work is that you need different people to come together in a circle. But individual meditation is very different from group meditation. And working in groups, if you've got everyone who's the same, it's going to fail. You're not going to be able to open that portal work with the elementals to go through that portal and to fly and soar to the world of spirit. So, talking a bit more about group meditation perhaps and, and what we can learn uh, with regards to the path of the serpent and how to find freedom in tomorrow's world. So if we're looking at being on the energy lines, which is the horizontal line, how do we connect with the vertical, with the vertical line? And here we have a, a, a beginnings of an understanding that there's a link to the elementals here and the kundalini forces within us. to know when to, to, to begin this one. Um, I should perhaps go back to, to start with on what we find with Earth energies when we actually uh, douse the centers of the lines. When we're looking at the centers of the lines as they run towards a node, each of us finds the center of the line at a slightly different position. And when we all stand on the centers of where we think the node is, we could be standing in a perfect circle if we've got the right six people. However, if there's two or more people who are the same, they'll be standing on the same, same particular place. And there'll be maybe a gap in the other area of the circle. 
It's as though each of us have a particular ability and skill. It's early days, we're still learning more about this, but one of the things is some people feel they can move energy around in a circle, like a vortex. Some people find they can move energy up and down and balance it that way. Some people feel they can hold energy. And there's a few other things with regards to bringing energy in and out through your heart as part of working with a group that makes group meditation uh, a very different exercise from working with, with individuals. And what Steiner's talking about moving from the fifth epoch to the sixth epoch, which is where we're heading now, is we're moving from individual consciousness back to group consciousness. That means rather than working on our own, we're working within groups. So that's what we have to sort of start beginning to get our heads around. What is it that we have to do within groups when we do group meditation? How do we actually work with these energies? And how they work with it within us? Um, and more importantly, how does, how does the, the Kundalini energies work within us too? And we're beginning to see uh, with regards to this path of the serpent and how we start and how we make the energies rise is the energies around us in the circle move. And if we allow the external energies to move us, we find that our own internal energies move in a similar way to the energies around us. So if you think about the path of the serpent, this is, this is the external energies now moving our own individual serpent-like kundalini forces within us but we're being guided by the external energies and how they change. Through intuition, we'll find that we will be lifting energy up because that's how the energy feels. That'll lift our energies up within us. And if the energies are coming down, that's bringing energies down through us. So we then have this weaving of energy through our body up and down, through our chakra system, through our awareness points, weaving the energy in ways that the external energetic environment is teaching us on the internal environment. If we work with intuition, then we are finding a way of our serpent path moving vertically upwards. And that then lifts our soul, we soar, and we can cross to the, the worlds of the spirit as a group. <laughs> didn't, know, didn't know I was on a buzzer. <laughs> <laughs> I felt that I was back at the Better Way conference then with a clock ticking going down, <laughs> down to minus five, minus six. So, um, so ho hopefully we can begin to see how the path of the serpent and our journey with these energies inside us and externally inside us is about soaring our spirit, our soul, across to the land of the spirit. So why, why perhaps is this relevant now? Why am I talking about that importance? Apart from just... The, uh, the oppressive regimes around the world who are really asking us to raise our game, to increase our, our will and intensity, intense willpower, to avoid being negative, and uh, to, to try and repress all these physical uh, uh, obstacles that they put, put in our way. That's where we're heading energetically appears to be what happens at the end of Goethe's fairy tale. And what I missed out earlier was the reason for the tale in the first place was because of, of a prophecy. And the only person that knows when this prophecy is going to happen is the green snake. The, the old man with the lamp is whispered that the, the, the time is at hand, the fourth secret is whispered to the old man. He then talks to the beautiful Lily, the princess, and she says, the time is at hand. And she, says, she hears the time is at hand by three people in the same day. And she knew that was the sign the prophecy would take place. And the prophecy was all about the green snake sacrificing herself. So that a permanent bridge could be finally built between the land of the senses and the land of the spirit. Where people could walk carriages with people could be taken across both ways between the land of the spirit and the land of the senses. This was the universal prophecy. 
and they and they they walked across this they took the sanctuary having gone through this from one side of it and it was this whole sanctuary that they were doing their meditation in came up and the final part of it was it came up into the fisherman the ferryman's old cottage where it established a whole new building an altar and it was signified then that a completely new way of life had begun the giant was left slumbering and uh, at that point they could see the sparkling new permanent bridge across the river so you have to start thinking well this this if this is part of a universal prophecy what's it all about what does a permanent bridge between the land of the senses and the land of the spirit mean and more importantly when's that happening now how will we know it's happening what will we see feel and hear at that point fortunately it's not the only universal prophecy we have there are quite a few and we get information from all of them from all around the world it's like no one person will be given all the information it'll be given to different cultures all around the world uh, even even remarkable geniuses like Steiner and, and Jung were given snippets of this universal prophecy and again Jung has this conversation with a serpent which is his elemental at the time and the serpent says a feast is being prepared and Jung says something flippant and the serpent says be a union amongst all humanity the veils of the world will be coming down you probably heard of that expression the veils of the world will be coming down so what what does that mean how are we going to consider does that mean we can see feel and hear all the different worlds is that the permanent bridge what does that permanent bridge now begin to look to how will we sense this are we sensing it already do we all get it at the same time or does maybe the awakened ones begin to sense it sooner than the others other prophecies which to choose uh, one of the greatest prophecies which has come to us is Black Elk's Great Vision has anyone come across Black Elk's Great Vision? Yeah, one or two. Black Elk was only about eight years old when he had this vision. And he was, he basically wasn't very well. And he came out of his body and he was met by two people who took him up into the clouds to meet his six grandfathers. And his six grandfathers then told him what would happen to him in his life. And what would happen later on uh, i won't go into the, the long whole story about it but the final climax of it all was these four ascents that he had to take his troop his, his his group of people on these four ascents to the south to the north to the east and the west and the interpretation of this is the group meditation that he had his people work with and it was all towards this final circle the sacred circle in the middle was this flowering tree and the flowering tree was the axis mundi the tree of life and it was all about the final fourth ascent the hardest ascent when he would face face the ma major challenges in, in, in his life and his other people's lives but this large last ascent he wasn't even going to be present he was soaring above them in spirit, in his spirit form, and his under the name Eagle Wing stretches. And when you study that prophecy, you begin to see how all the elements of group meditation come into play, and how we have a collectively to go through this journey in order to get to that point where all humanity becomes one. And uh, the end of the vision is like the golden age. So. When we're looking at what we might expect and what we find people already around the world beginning to experience and even Jung himself 
experienced this. He was walking down the street, and it was a, a, a street in, in, in Switzerland, and he saw this horse with a knight on, back, on his back riding down the street next to him and past him in broad daylight. This wide awake vision was totally real to him. And people are now already experiencing strange things as though they were real, as though they were in dreams. And this can only be put down to a heightened sense of perception, a heightened awareness, where our range of feeling and seeing and hearing was suddenly extended so that all the different frequencies of matter were suddenly coming into view. Just snippets for a moment. So if you think about this uh, bridge, the permanent bridge between the worlds, this veils coming down so we can suddenly see, feel and hear everything. This potentially is what's in store for us in the future. When our senses are energized with this, all this higher energetic environment, our senses are heightened at such extent that our range of perceptions are massively widened. And we can hear and see and feel things that we couldn't before. So how do we do this? How do we do group meditation? Unfortunately, the prophecies there that also tell us how, but we haven't discovered everything about them yet. So one of the, one of the challenges that I, I, I would put to you is we need to learn more about how we do group meditation from all the people, all the groups around the world, all the, the tribes, the cultures, learning how they do what they do. And it's a bit to do with working with these energies, as I've said before. And if you want, if anyone who's really good at symbols, if you look at Jung's red book, there are pictures that he draws when he crosses this same river, the same abyss that Goethe's talking about, that Steiner talks about. And he has conversations with an elemental he calls the black alchemist, the black magician. Ha is his name. And Ha has given him all these symbols and he's put them on top of all these items that he's been seeing in his red book images. And these offer us the clues on how we work within group meditation and, and how we move energy within our bodies up and down, whether we send it out, receive it in, working in the group. And uh, I wish I could tell you more about that particular thing, but I'm just mentioning it here because group meditation is the way forward going into group uh, consciousness. We've, we've also found, uh, I've been running something called uh, the Sacred Path Modules, uh, and uh, that's why we set up the Sacred Network, and I'll talk a bit more about that in the end. But in the group discussion modules, in a similar way to the meditation uh, and, and the dowsing, where we find there's the individual uniqueness that's so important. We find when you start sharing dialogue in groups with different types of people, when you start looking at a picture, maybe at a, a Someone like Dali has, has actually painted, and you think, what on earth is that all about? Or maybe a, a, some music that someone's put, put together and he, that takes you away and lifts you into different things. When you start getting a group together to, to look at the insights that come from them, you begin to see that you're seeing life two-dimensionally on your own. And when you listen to other people, uh, the thoughts that come from them, the insights that come from them, suddenly you're getting a three-dimensional perspective on something you thought you knew. And I can only say that is something you need to experience because it, it's, it's one of the best ways of holding a mirror up to you. One of the, one of the things the guardian of the threshold does is it stops you going unless you're fully prepared. Other prophecies are talking about the mirror, knowing yourself before you go forward. And group, group work like that when you see how other people have so obviously strengths that you don't have, you have to then realize that must be my own weakness. And it makes you want to do something about that. It's a very powerful experience of me having a mirror held up to you. And in a lot of these universal prophecies, you find these mirrors in order to prepare so that you can then go on this journey of the path of the, of the serpent. And the other interesting thing about the path of the serpent which is really strange, 
is your serpent dies when you reach the other side. Which brings another whole realm of what exactly your serpent is. And we know this because Jung painted it and talked about it. And he even had conversations with the elementals. And the elementals told him we wish to die for our master. Because dying is about transforming. The whole elemental idea that they're shapeshifters, they transform. They change from one character to another. And, and, and Steiner uh, originally meets Isdubar, the giant, the guardian of the threshold between the west and the east. And both initially were stunned. Stein, uh, Jung couldn't go any further east because the sun was blinding him and Isdubar couldn't go further west because the science was poisoning him. And they were, there they were between the two worlds, stuck. Until the, sci the, the actual Isdubar became ill. And in order to cure him, uh, Jung just realized he had to sort of make him the size of a, of, of a tiny little person and put him in his pocket, take him to the west and to incubate him as an egg. The point being is, later on, Jung realized that that, that god he'd birthed and the egg had hatched also later became Philemon. Philemon was a, this huge chap with kingfisher wings that flew towards him and they had endless conversations and that's when Jung realized that he couldn't possibly have been making it up. It could only have come from his subconscious. And then Philemon said to him, I will become Farnes, the, the keeper of the four streams. So this all throughout this, he's, he's realizing that the character he's talking to in the subconscious is his own ill elemental. And the elemental wishes to die for us because the elemental that we carry, I'm not talking about the nature elementals here, the, our own elemental, that has to go through a series of transformations. Elizabeth H. in her book, in Initiate, says we have to spiritualize our serpent. If we want to transform, if we want to transcend and grow and develop, then our serpent has to as well. So the serpent wishes to die for his master because death is not the end, it's the beginning, it's the rebirth, and you begin the new thing. So the path of the serpent is this endless birth and rebirth of your own inner subconscious connection, which is represented visually in the subconscious by the elemental that shapeshifts. So recognizing that, you see the path of the serpent is one of continual transformation because if you can transform your elemental, that's you transforming. That's allowing you to become someone who can soar across the abyss of darkness where you will get all the obstacles and challenges which mirror the same difficulties we have in our physical world. Soaring above those is about going within to find that true source of, of freedom, the freedom of the human soul. So, in, in summary, from that, that perspective, coming back to the path of the serpents and how to find freedom in tomorrow's world. It, it, this whole thing seems to be about coming together in groups, in group meditation, in order to discover who we really are and how we really fit in. And for that, we dis we, we, a group of us put together something called the Sacred Network. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's a free uh, social media platform where you can form groups, join groups, and start group meditations, join other, other group meditations. And, and you'll see there's a site map with lots of different sacred sites on it. And you'll know where to go in do those group meditations because location seems to be important. Just like beautiful Lily in, in the Goethe's fairy tale was in a very specific place on the land of the physical, in the land of the senses. We need to go to these locations in order to take that meditative trip, that incubatory journey across to the land of the spirit. So. I would invite you, if you're not members, to, to go there and look for meditations or start meditations or join us. And, and uh, the ones that we've had already, uh, we've been doing in Oliver's Castle and a few other places where we've been getting uh, 100, 200 people coming together in group meditations. This is a start. What we're looking to do is actually move on to smaller numbers. 
where there's 12 or 24, because we're at the beginning of the game of understanding group meditation. The movements, the side-to-side -side movements, the figure of eight movements that we have. For a while we all felt we were doing this figure of eight movement and wondering why. Knowing it had something to do with Steiner's eurythmy, something to do with Peter Dunoff's pan -eurythmy. And Peter Dunoff had an amazing universal prophecy and a great vision at the end of his life. Guessing everybody knows Peter Junoff? Hmm? I don't know the prophecy. No, okay. Um, Peter Junoff was the most amazing Bulgarian writer and philosopher. Um, he, he, even Einstein said he bows down to him. As, as the, he's the most prolific writer that Bulgaria ever had. Um, people might remember him from uh, his organization of Universal White Brotherhood, where people dressed in white and they would go up to the mountains in Rila uh, and they would have these huge circles of dancing movements. And, and panurismy is very much moving the body with the energies and connection to the sun and the stars and the earth and the moon. And Steiner with eurythmy was also getting the body to move with the energy moving. And one of these figure of eight movements like this, in, the, in a circle, is when you take the energy into your heart and you're out, and you're, you're sending it out to all the other members in the circle at the beginning of your, of your meditation. So if you feel your body making this figure of eight, it's the energies telling you this is the time to send blessings to all those around you. It's just one beginning of things we're beginning to learn. So with... With that in mind, we need more people experimenting in small groups. Maybe splitting the groups up so we have half the group who can actually help prepare the way for the group that are actually doing the meditation. They're the ones who will do the drumming. They'll be doing the chanting. And facilitating for the inner group who are going on their journey at that sacred site. So I'm trying to give the impression here that we actually we don't know what we're doing but there's an awful lot more we can learn if we do it and we share what we do. So that's my, my invitation to you from this, is that the more we do this, the more we will discover the path of our serpent, which is our own progression by progressing our own elementals. And that's the journey that we can use to soar across to the land of the spirit. And even though we're not necessarily aiming to go across the land of the spirit now, we may not have a reason to go across the land of the spirit, it's hugely important if collectively mankind and all humanity is going on this journey when the veils come down between the worlds, when there's a permanent bridge between the land of the senses and the land of the spirit. Because not everybody has the will, the intensity of the will at the outset to make this journey. So those that do have that intensity have to start because once we begin it, all humanity will then come through and follow. And that's, that's the challenge we have as, as, a, as the awakening group that we are right now. Because you're all awakened because you're here. Okay. So, uh, it's in our case of sitting back and doing nothing and waiting for it to happen because it won't happen. More and more of us have to do this. And the wonderful thing about going to these group meditations is that it actually is spellbinding. Magic starts happening at these places. And you don't have to have anyone leading you. You just, just allow the, the, the actual energies to guide you. And that lifts your spirit. That helps you begin to soar. And that's the, that's the name of the game. And when you have that, there's nothing. The middle, awkward little people who want to run the world <laughs> can do. We are free from them. Well, unfortunately, we've got to take them with us. So thank you very much for your time. If you've got any questions and answers, I'll do my best. Hey. I have a question about um, uh, where does that will come from? Do you think? Where does the will come from to begin with? It's a good question and one my wife and I were thinking about on the way here. <laughs> It, it's uh, a partly it's you're born with it that could be to do with your stage and your karmic cycle that you've come back with a purpose a mission 
and we're realizing and we're waking up to that right now. And just that knowledge that you have had something in your life you have to do, there's a purpose, there's a passion, there's an interest in something which just is really weird. Where does that passion and interest come from? That, I think, is the first recognition that you are on here. You're, you've come back to do something specific. And there's a drive that's built into your, you know, into your hard wired into your, into your soul even, to do that. And, and we don't need everybody to wake up. We really don't. It's almost as though we, 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 10, 15 percent of us is enough to start the ball rolling. The rest will be drawn along with us. So, but how to encourage, encourage that? Well, um, coming together in groups will inspire that will. But alternatively, isolating us, which is what they're trying to do right now, isolate us, stop us coming together, then those that do have those strong urges to do something, those urges will go. They will, they will die. Their dreams will die. Which is sad, but it happens. But the only way of, of, of uh, overcoming those things, overcoming fear and, and doubt, is to do something. Action dispels fear. So we can get that will if we come together. And we can get huge, intense will. And remember that will, bizarrely, is something we need to have when we prepare at the outset. But at that moment of going into that, that meditation, we have to surrender it. We have to get rid of it. We have to get rid of our ego, all of that. And that getting out of the way is a challenge for a lot of people. Thank you for that. Any, any? Yeah. Um, I'm struck by the similarity with what you're saying and the information coming out of the near-death experience, in particular with Evan Alexander. Um, he was saying that it appears there's a way that we humans can transition before death, which I think Jesus said in lots of the Gospels as well. Yes. Um, do you notice a similarity? Yeah, he's just asking about the similarities between near-death experiences, um, what people like Jesus taught, crossing the water spirit, um, absolutely, it's the same thing. We're getting glimpses in our near-death experiences of the possible. Uh, and, and yes, there's that tunnel and light at the end of it and conversations which can blow your, main, blow your mind. It, it's almost like a reminder of your mission as well. You're sent back sometimes because you still have a purpose. And it's a lovely story of Manny's Pearl. Anyone know about the story of Manny's Pearl? Um, uh, Manny, uh, Manny's Pearl is a story about uh, a young child that's sent down into the land of the senses in Egypt. And he's dressed like an Egyptian and his parents are watching from the clouds from the land of the spirit. And as soon as he gets down to the land of Egypt, he's, his purpose is to, is completely forgotten. He's, he's, he's forgotten why he's there. He becomes like a normal Egyptian. So his parents send him a, a, an eagle, I think it was, with, with a message. And he goes down and, he, and the eagle gives him a message. And as soon as he gets the message, he remembers his reason for why he was living. And that's like a message from him. And he then goes to find this dragon underwater who's protecting the pearl. And he has to charm the dragon before he then collects the pearl and then takes it back up to the land of spirit. So, it's, it's, so we have to be reminded. And near-death experiences are a very good one. And, and, and uh, I've known people who've had them have gone on to do quite incredible things. One, one is a, is a friend of mine called Chris Robinson, who's a dream detective. Um, he dreams the future. He's been tested on countless times. And what he's done is just phenomenal. But he had a near-death experience. And he, he literally bargained <laughs> at the door, at St. Peter's door, if you like. He said, and, and they sent him back. And he knew he had, had to do certain things and he couldn't do anything else. So, yeah, thank you for that question. Any others? Yeah. The, the serpent, which from what I gather that you've explained, is not purely a, a sign of evil or something to almost be afraid of. Yet the, the medical industry is symbolized by the symbol, uh, the, the serpent. But the medical industry, by and large, is one of the hearts of darkness, for want of a better way of putting it. How do you tie in the symbol of the serpent with the medical industry, which obviously fits in with our times too? 
why do they use the server? Why have they used the server? The original, um, and there's, there's two here to, to talk about. The first is the staff of Asclepius, uh, which is a single staff and a single snake. And Asclepius, Asclepius was the Greek god of healing. And back then they knew about the, uh, the, the central spinal column and the serpent and the Ida, Pingala, Shushumna forces that go up and how the Ida and Pingala make the Shushumna when they're in balance. So that they, they, they knew about that from way before they, they uh, chose to purposely make the serpent in the Garden of Eden as, uh, as evil because it was against the Gnostic Gospels and the Gnostic way of thinking that Jesus was teaching and others before him, like John the Baptist, that uh, the, the serpent in the Garden of Eden was actually known as the instructor, the teacher. And it had uh, inside it this uh, um, male and female instructing principles, they call, I think the translation was. So within the serpent there are these forces. And even Sina talked about these forces inside the serpents that have to be maintained and in balance. Um, so like, like, the, like they would do, they just decided to say, well, it's, it's all sinful. And if you say it's sinful and, and it's evil enough, just see what TV does today and, and, and repetition and how all the media is repeating things in, in harmony. And, and, and there are some people who can't cope with that. They'll just accept it, yeah, serpents are evil. Even Jung had this huge issue for years, overcoming the fact that serpent wasn't evil. No, I haven't seen it. I'd like to. I have seen uh, dragons in in, uh, in the Vatican Gardens. Uh, I've seen the Ouroboros on paintings in the galleries. In in in, in there. In there. And um, but uh, something in the ceiling. I'll, I'll have to look out for that when I get a chance to go there again. But but. Talk about the satanic elements, because obviously the, the Vatican has been taken over, I believe, by satanic elements anyway. I don't know whether people share that. Well, no, the, the Catholic Church think there's absolutely apostasy at the top of the Catholic Church. And Father Malachi Martin, who worked with cardinals and the popes for years, has come out in his books and said that. Even Padre Pio, the, the, uh, the priest who could uh, bilocate and do other amazing things, has said there's an, there was apostasy in the church. And we know it's dividing the church. There's a schism right now in the church. And, and um, if you start looking back at the early popes, there's some pretty nefarious people in there too. So, uh, but uh, I personally think it started from the deliberate uh, crucifixion of St. Peter upside down uh, in Nero's circus at the time. And the pyramids and, and the needles, and the obelisks they were put up, it's tapping into a, a type of force which is opening up to demons. And the weaknesses in those people were very quickly infiltrated and I think that's happening all around the world as well as the weak weak people we, we, uh, never before have we had such politicians who are so weak uh, so, so many so, sorry. I'm just wondering sorry it's a serpent that has been sort of appropriated by those dark forces or yeah it could be like the Kundalini can be used for good as well it can also be used for ill if it's not uh, absolutely yeah uh, uh, these, these uh, energies are neutral but not the higher element, higher, that the really higher energies from the sun and from the galaxy, that they're, they're, they're very much more linked to Christ consciousness and to, to that. So, and, and the evil minded demonic beings who are guiding the poor humans today, they can't cope with that light and that love. So as long as we, we work on these, on these lines as opposed to some of the, what we call the moon phase lines, which are more easily able to be tapped into by these demonic people, will be fine. And the banker grid lines as well. Yeah. Yeah. I've got one um, <coughs> for me. When I read about Satan, which many people seem to take as an entity, it doesn't make sense to me if I think of the creator being 
good, what we all aspire to. So when I've read into it, I read that the original word Satan means ignorance. And is it not just our own ignorance of what we are that allows us to make wrong choices and therefore we have to have the consequences of those actions? Eventually we have to uh, face what we, what we have constructed. And I read recently a very interesting um, interpretation of adultery, which we all think of as being within a marriage context, but actually adultery, thou shalt not commit adultery, means do not adulterate spiritual energy. It's got nothing to do with anything else. So the question is, do you actually think Satan is an entity, which I don't, or is it something constructed again by the Vatican to um, make us fearful? Thank you. A question about Satan. Who was he? What did he do? <laughs> what, why is he here? Is, is, he a is he a servant of evil? Um, have we got it all wrong? Or, or, or what, what, what is that? I, I, I'm going to put my scientific hat on here for, to answer this. Um, I believe that we're living in a universe that exists with cycles within cycles within cycles. And, and pretty much the uh, cycles that we're going through roughly every six, 12,000 years is an increase in energy and a decrease in energy. And when we have an increase in energy, we return to group consciousness, we realize who we are, and we go back to that point of learning and remembering. But in the times of individual consciousness, when the energies aren't very high, we have a situation where we lose track of where we are, we don't know who we are. But it's a great exploratory phase in mankind. We're forced individually in our individual consciousness to explore the environment that we're in. So there's tremendous benefits from that. But because of what we forget, we're sent help, a bit like Manny's pill. We're sent help. And help is a strange thing because it's not always good. Some of the best lessons we learn in life is through some of the worst challenges we ever face. So if you've got a chaotic element that's evil, that's specifically in this world creating chaos and evil, that is a rod to stir the environment to help the good rise up and become stronger. We learn our best lessons in those ways. So is Satan a servant of God? Is, is Lucifer, a fallen angel, there to do the very work that God needs him to do so that we can wake up and actually get out of our dream and realise, actually, no, this person is just yet another psychopath who's helping us. <laughs> so so it, but, but it, it's, I certainly I, I want to make one thing. There's no opposites, good and evil, no. There's no opposites. There's two aspects of the same thing. There's hot and cold. It's not. It's just degrees of temperature. We've got to get away from these opposites. This whole thought, thinking of opposites has been drilled into us by the politicians, the Hegelian dialectic, to divide us. Tories, Labour, they're all liars. Red, uh, Republicans, Democrats, they all lie. Okay? It, it, it's, it's all the same thing. So my answer, if, if you want what I think Saturn is, Satan is, it's an instrument to help us. It's a gift. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just watch out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it took me about 50 years to realize this, that every bad thing that happens is giving you an opportunity of choice. choice. The choice you make is your own, but that really nasty stuff. Yeah. Uh, I only learned it in retrospect. I wasn't going to and, 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 and if you didn't hear at the back, it's about us being given a choice. And, and uh, there's a great book which you all, you all know is with, with the Only Planet of, of Choice by Phyllis Schlemmer. Um, and um, that's why we don't get given help by when we pray up necessary. You know, we, they, we need to take the choice. We can't do it. We have to do it. And even though that choice is right now coming together, meditating. Is that 10 seconds or 10 minutes? <laughs> 
coming together in group meditation and choosing to do that, choosing to do something is, is choice. So absolutely, yeah. And, and yeah, choosing to do the wrong thing, of course, is uh, another lesson. Yeah. Whatever is right. That's another yeah. interesting thing. What do we need? What do we, what do we pray for? How do we, we, we give, given this power of manifestation, the Templars knew about it. You could, you could go to these sites and you could manifest. We know that ancients did this for weather. They needed crops to grow. They needed rain. They needed sun. And, and the, the people who were really good at manifestation knew it worked because it was resulting there. It, it all happens. And you, you see evidence of this all the time, but you soon realize that just because you can manifest something, what do you need to manifest? What do you need in your life right now? And this is the other interesting thing about the abyss I was talking about earlier. So you don't know what you need. You don't know what aspects of your character. You, you can't look at the mirror yourself and say, oh, that's cool. Okay. What are your weaknesses? What are your flaws? What should you attend to next? And this is a wonderful thing about the abyss and that darkness is that it's your subconscious that challenges you. It knows exactly what you need. So we can't ask for what we need and what we want. We, we have one get out clause. We can ask for more synchronicity. I just have to say though that on the subject of the satanic, whether or not you believe it's an entity, in the name of that entity, huge atrocities are perpetrated every day and there are survivors of horrific abuse, children in great numbers. And I, I feel that whether or not you want to describe it as an entity, it is nonetheless an energetic force. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. You can create the energies. Yeah. Um, and therefore, it needs them. to be understood and seen. We need to confront the shadow. I mean, there are there may not be opposites, but <coughs> yin and yang, there's a shadow and there's a light. And you have to confront the shadow to reach the light. A hundred percent agree. We just don't know how yet, but we're working on it. The, the, there's, I don't, I, I, has anyone read my recent newsletter at all? I don't blame you if you haven't, it's still on the line. We addressed this, we, we wanted to send energy into the heart of Rome. And we had to, two lovely people who were on Mount Carvo, at the node on Mount Carvo, and we had people all around the world ready to send energy into Rome from the new node we were actually, we'd just been repaired. I have two friends who were in, in Peru, got that sorted. Heart of Rome, energy going in, <laughs> nothing, nothing, blank wall. And, and uh, the, 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 la the lady in the, in the trap in Mount Carbo sends this golden energy light through, out to the heart of Rome. Seconds it comes back grey, dirty, headache. What's going on? And this was like 20, 30 of us that I, I spoke to. Something in Rome is not right. And um, it, it's not like, I mean, it's not like a simple thing like soul rescue and things like that. There's something much, much more serious here. And so we've, we've got a team of about 30, 40 people now on working on this. And, and it's spread to London, City of London, and also Washington, D.C. And, and there could be other spreads. We need to get to grips with exactly what the problem is. And it's to do with the, with the uh, for starters, some energy is sinking away. There's a sink which has been taken by the dark, darker, darker elements and being used. They're creating fear. Louche is, is, is the, what they feed off. It's, it's a, I, I wish I had some answers from you yet, but we're, we're uncovering stuff which goes back before the, the Catholic Church. It, it does. It goes back to the, uh, Roman and pre-Roman times. And uh, at the moment, from the people who seem to have gathered Rather bizarrely, it looks like there's, there's got to be a conversation with the lower frequencies to restore balance. Yeah, I hope that helps answer the question. Sorry, one of you. Uh, when you said there about bounce back, yeah. does it not make sense that they have a defense system over their place? Yeah. 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 yeah, the problem with defense systems is that it's, a, it, 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 it's, it, it's a, allowing a chink of fear in your armor. You should, you, 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 putting protective aura around you, 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 you shouldn't do that unless you actually say, protect me if I'm supposed to be protected. If I'm not, so be it. Because 
it's their way of getting information. So you've got, if you, if you just never felt anything bad, you'd never know there was an alarm, there was a problem. Uh, and as, as for uh, suddenly thinking about it coming back a different color, well, when you set out to, to do something mentally, maybe let's say you, you, you want to think of a black cat and, and suddenly a, 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 a white one appears in your head instead. Well, I didn't want to think of a white, white cat, I just wanted to think of a, of a black cat. Well, your subconscious is grabbing your attention. This whole business of dowsing, we teach going from focus, focused mind, conscious mind state to the aware subconscious state. This is a conversation you're going from one to the other, but we have to start listening to what your subconscious gives you. And when you're in a completely surrendered state, you're open to the answers from the subconscious. And that means you're going to get in information which you perhaps don't expect. Symbols, you can see, hearings, or even feeling. All of those ways you get actually contacted. Depending on how your own submodalities are strong or weak, you'll find that uh, your subconscious, your elemental, if you like, will find a way of communicating what they want you to know. So the, another question? Yeah. Yeah, just right, right into the present. Um, the, the revelations that are going on in the US at the moment about uh, unidentified flying objects and aliens. Okay? So we clearly see that there might be an opportunity there to scare the world that we're being attacked by, <coughs> by uh, you know, bad intent, uh, aliens with bad intent. But I also wonder, is, that, is it actually possible that some genuine truths behind it that actually help us, will help humanity to understand what's facing the universe better? It's very difficult to answer that question when the manipulation is so deep. I, I am completely convinced that physics has been completely, totally made up. I do not agree with relativity at all. Tesla never agreed with relativity theory. He was a person who was interested in the ether. My old friend Ron Pearson who came up with a new theory on the, on, the, on the creation of the universe, the only floor three theory of quantum gravity. When you take out relativity theory, because the big problem they've had is put relativity with, with quantum theory, how do the two get together? And the only way they can put it together with mathematics is the absurdities of multiple dimensions. We live with three dimensions, that's it. You can't envisage fourth or fifth or sixth dimension. It's just poppycock. They, they, they're stuck with this problem because of something called the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, where you put a particle and a beam of light through slits, and you pick up the interference pattern on the other side of the, on the background plate. The only way they can, can explain that back then is saying, well, the particle behaves like a wave when it wants to, and a particle when it wants to. And depending on how you actually collapse the wave function on the, on the background, you can get a particle, you can get a wave. No, that's just wrong thinking at the time, it was the best they could come up with. Nobody has revisited that since. And yet the new theory doesn't require that, that interpretation of quantum mechanics at all. You don't need all these multiple universes. You actually have, instead, this is when I come to the question, a range of seeing, which we can see visible light, a range of hearing, we can hear within a certain range of frequencies, but we have a range of feeling as well. And that range of feeling is limited to a certain range. And I talked about earlier about extension of heightened awareness, more perceptions. Seeing, feeling and hearing will be a much, much wider range of perceptions. And what we'll see is the other worlds of spirit, when we want to, because with the heart center, we can focus in on what we want to see, feel and hear. They have beings living in these different worlds. If you think of Ragnarok and that, that prophecy, the, the world of the, the giants, the dwarves, all those people. They're, these are living beings in different frequencies of matter. So if you're asking me about aliens, real aliens, and what they're changing it into, these don't come from the other sides of space. You couldn't explain that time travel without some weird physics anyway. These are beings that live here right now where we are on a different frequency of matter. So if you're talking about aliens, from outer space, just think of them from inner space, where they're here already. Now think about their technology. Think of our technology from the point of view of 
what we were doing 12,000 years ago. And you start going back into the archaeological evidence and suddenly you think, how did they make these things back in 12,000 years ago? You've got granite, I'm a geologist, granite and diorite, some of the hardest rocks with quartz in it, that looks like it's been hand turned on a potter's wheel with absolute precision, that they're finding hundreds and hundreds of these in the uh, stepped pyramid, the Joseph Sat pyramid, and, and, and these are nothing that could have been made four or 5,000 years ago. You look at the poly polygonal masonry that you pick up, tight, perfect slots in, in 40, 50 ton, ton, ton slots you find at Saxeho Man in Peru. You find them in Japan. You find them all around the world, in Atri in Italy. You find them at the, at the, in the Queen's Temple in Egypt. You find them at the base of the Kafe pyramids. Polygonal masonry, huge. We, we don't have the technology for that. But if we're in a period of the past where there was group consciousness, when all the veils of humanity had come down, when the giants were amongst us again, which the Bible talks about the giants being amongst us on lots of times. This is a time when there was advanced civilizations and less advanced civilizations all together in the same place. So if you're talking about aliens 12,000 years ago, and think of how much we've advanced, just imagine how much all those other beings on those other worlds have advanced in the same time as well. They've had their same period of individual consciousness. They're returning to group consciousness. Yes, there's a big thing on about bringing aliens back into our world and just saying all that, but if you start looking at what they're saying is they're teaching us already to hate. So they'll give you a question, were the giants good or bad? And I can tell you now, if they're going to tell you the giants are bad, you know they're not. <laughs> so they're bringing it round again because make no mistake, this whole group consciousness thing, they're completely aware of this game. They really are. They're just not going to tell us. Because the less of us that wake up, the less of us that evolve, the easier it is for them to become the new commanders of the, of, of the golden age. And our challenge this time round, this is the real challenge, is that, and, and the sad thing about it is that the rest of the universe, all the other beings, all the other worlds know this. Even our animals know what we're going through. We're the last to wake up. <laughs> Literally, look to the nature. They're telling us, that they're giving us the signs. We've got to come together. So if you see the aliens, great. Okay? Well, if you hear them, if you hear them talking about it, yeah, good. We know, it's gonna, we know the whole thing's going to happen. It gives us strength. We, we make our own choices and, and decide what we do. We, we, we take back our inner sovereignty. And that's the key there. So uh, uh, that, that's how I see the alien side of it. But, uh, and, and yeah, they're going to have uh, technology, which is advanced. That's how they can pop in and out of our, our matter frequency system and disappear. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much. That's a, a question. How do we support children of today who are exhibiting signs of uh, telepathy, clairvoyance, and those things. Um, th th this is something that, uh, by the way, that Steiner came up with, not me. <laughs> I just uh, studied the geniuses. But uh, the characteristic traits, if we look at what Steiner was doing, he was preparing the souls of, of 100 years ago. In fact, August, I was telling Richard, uh, August 100 years ago, Rudolf Steiner was in North Wales. August, two th literally 100 years ago. He was at a place called Penn Mine Moor, and he was giving a talk, 12 lectures on the evolution of consciousness. This is what we're talking about right now. And every day he would walk up into the hills on North, uh, just by Penn Mine Moor, and all there are all these druid circles. And he knew about the energies, he could feel them. And he was preparing the souls of the people who was listening to him there at that North Wales town. He knew they would be coming back today, re being reborn today. Our role, or his role back then, was preparing for the children of light who are coming. Our role today is to prepare for the children of light. I, I literally think it's as close as our children now that are going to be streaming in all this consciousness. We, we probably won't see it. We're a bit old. 
but our job is to prepare the way and preparing the environment this is to answer your question is if, if we have an acceptable environment for them to live in through community through groups where they feel they can nurture and talk about what they do without anyone saying you're a nutter let's section you let's put you into a, into a, into a, that's the environment they need which is going to mean homeschooling which is going to mean just being able to talk to people who don't think you're crazy so that's that's community and and, and one of the, another reason we built the, the sacred network is this is totally decentralized it's it's encrypted on the blockchain the CIA can't even put any cookies in you can have your own private group with your own friends and you form your own connections there and you can have conversations which you wouldn't have perhaps face to face in front of anybody else so we need to create that environment for the children of light yeah so uh, sorry. I, I'm watchless <laughs> one last thing uh, um, if I might just say I, I've got a, a, a one-day seminar on the 24th of September in Dorset this is specifically for anybody who might want to become a facilitator for the sacred path modules so just put that date in the, in the diary, 24th of September, all-day event. We're going to teach you to become proper to, to, to be facilitators. We're going to have breakout rooms and we're going to go through some of the prophecies. And you're going to have a chance of working in groups of your own to see the power of what we talk about, gaining insights on insights. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Charles. And that's it. Thank you very much for your time.